All right, Jillian Michaels, you are, I would say, the legit OG in the fitness space. You may or may not agree, but I mean, you've been around the block on this stuff. And <laughs> I have been around the block, <laughs> that is for sure. And I think it's going to be interesting and possibly even liberating for people to hear that you've changed your mind on things. You've changed your perspective throughout your career. And you haven't been like hard nosed, like head in the sand on though. This is my only way that I'm going to do this. And this is, you know, forever. So what are what are some things that you've maybe pivoted on okay. throughout your career? So full disclaimer, I would highly recommend a product called Seed if you're looking for a probiotic. It's not the takeaway from this video, don't get me wrong. I just thought I'd mention it because people always ask me what probiotic I recommend. So I put a link down below that saves you 25% off Seed's daily symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and a probiotic in one. You've seen me talk about it before, a capsule inside of a capsule. So really cool multi-stage delivery, fascinating research behind it. I just really stand behind it. It's the one that I personally use, and that is the honest truth. I don't use a lot of supplements, but probiotics are one that I do throw into the mix now and then, and I do use seeds. So that link is down below, 25% off. Highly, highly recommend it, especially if you're making a dietary change. So whenever you make a change, it's important to help remodel the gut microbiome by adding in a good probiotic. And most probiotics, in my opinion, are garbage. So that link down below for a good one. If we divide this into periods of my life, prior to 30, I would say pretty much everything I believed with regard to nutrition and health was wrong to the degree that I, I had to publicly apologize for my first book. Like it wasn't demanded of me, but I felt <laughs> obligated to because there were recipes with, I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> I, uh, I said that, not him. And I am all filled up on lawsuits. So you can make your own opinions about that. Do your own research. Nevertheless, I wouldn't recommend it to this day um, at this point in time or artificial sweeteners, all that stuff. I just thought, well, it's calories in calories out. And it, I still hold that belief when it comes to weight loss, but where that Venn diagram intersects with health, the quality of your food is going to matter. And it just wasn't something I really understood. I didn't understand what metabolism was and what role your hormones played and how your metabolism functioned. I was overweight as a kid. I had PCOS that I struggled with in particular in my teens. And if you think about what was going on, when I was having these ovarian cysts and being rushed to the emergency room at 17, it was the fat makes you fat era. God bless Susan Patter. I don't know if you <laughs> remember this, but this was this woman that would go on infomercials late at night and talk about how if you ate fat, you would become fat. And it all seemed to make sense at 17 years old. I was like, oh, well, this is terrible. So I would eat nothing but processed flour all day long spaghetti that you would buy for 50 cents and make, you know, with cheap tomato sauce filled with sugar, but it was in the right calorie range. I mean, all of that stuff. It wasn't until I started to have all of these issues and I worked out so I could mitigate all of these things. Like I could mitigate my weight because I worked out and I didn't eat too much. And as I got to be about 30 years old, I developed um, melasma, which is the, the pregnancy mask, right? Where you start to get this mm -hmm. hyperpigmentation on your face. And what is going on? I end up going to see um, my endocrinologist, and it turns out like, oh, you, you have hypothyroidism, slight, but still, right? Like, why? You have this pregnancy mask, I'm certainly not pregnant. And I began to ask these questions like, why am I experiencing these things? And that's really when Michael Pollan started to emerge um, with the omnivore's dilemma. Mm -hmm. And the organics movement started to really take hold. I think people, it was not on the radar. It just wasn't. So if I'm 30, this is quite some time ago, <laughs> 18 years ago, it was 32 um, and it went from the girl that wrote Winning by Losing, which was like my first season on Biggest Loser, and this is how you lose weight, to the girl that wrote Master Your Metabolism with a board-certified endocrinologist named Christine Darwin. And I really began to understand uh, the quality of your food in relation to health, not just calories in, calories out. So that arguably over the course of my career is my biggest mistake. Now that seems obvious and it's not sexy. It's like, well, what have you changed your mind on recently that's trending in the zeitgeist of TikTok? <laughs> 
And to be honest, I would tell you that as a normie, meaning like I'm not a PhD and I'm not an MD, I talk to a lot of them, just like you do. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that you could talk to an incredibly credible PhD who will tell you something completely different than another incredibly credible PhD on protein or on intermittent fasting or on, you, know, you name the trend, keto. Mm -hmm. I've heard completely opposing viewpoints. But what this has done for me is always brought me to the middle organically. And what I mean by that is I always defer to common sense now mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, this trend's amazing. I don't buy it. And I'll try to put two and two together from things I've learned over time. Okay, so here's here's where I'm going because I really had to think about this. Here's where I've been egregiously wrong. The first one is sauna. Hmm. Like pathetically wrong. <laughs> so embarrassingly wrong. And I would have told you why. You're dehydrating yourself. You're fatiguing yourself. Like, what are you hoping to get out of this? You're not going to sweat out toxins. That's bull. And I had good evidence from great doctors to tell me it was. They're like, you're not sweating out heavy metals. That's a crock. You're going to lose it through you know, your kidneys and your liver. And this is how you get rid of all this stuff. And anyway, the long story short is then Rhonda Patrick comes out with all this information and makes it public, essentially. Everything she knows. And she's like, oh, you can sweat out cadmium and aluminum and this and that and the other. And you're going to, you get these heat shock proteins and they maintain your cellular integrity and it could prevent amyloid plaques from clumping. And I just was like, <laughs> so off base. So that one I'm really willing to take a hit on. I was, you know, a 180, totally off. Protein. Yeah. There's not a day that goes by. Oh, too much to heart disease and, <laughs> and, and cancer and it activates this growth pathway. Oh no, not enough. And you're going to be frail when you're old and break a hip and every day yeah. to the point that I'm like, okay, let's think about this for a second. I'm eating probably 1800 calories a day. All right. You know, what's the, what's the threshold? How many, oh, you can only process, what is it? 30, 50 mm. grams of protein in a meal. Okay, well, ultimately, where do you net out? Like, I don't go over 30%. And I try to get at least 500 calories worth, which is really kind of just under that. And I should be safe there. I try not to get less than 15% in a day. But beyond that, like, I, I can't. Well, <laughs> I can't. I can't deal with it. Every day there's another study. And we look at, we're starting to look at humans as as machines right like there's there are definitely days that go by where my protein intake is low period and there are definitely days that go by where my protein intake is high and i like that you keep saying net out like right like where do you net right. out and that's where people it's like they look at their screens they watch this content and they almost become zombies about it where it's just like i need 50 percent of my calories from protein and if i don't do that it, it like harms their identity and it harms and it, it's actually damaging people and it becomes a game of like clout chasing all the time because if i if i release me, i put so a video well put. out put a video out that says hey this study says it's why i've had to almost remove myself from my content and become a little bit more like let's just look at the literature and then let me give you my opinion and right. let's, let's like segregate that there yeah and then it's like if i say one thing but then someone with a thousand more followers than me yes. says another thing, then I'm the idiot yes. and I'm the pseudoscientist. If someone with, yes, if, if Andrew Huberman says something as a PhD, but someone that is a PhD and an MD yes. says something that then Huberman's wrong. It's just like, it's, it becomes this clout chasing game of it's instead of what actually f works, it's more about like, well, who says it more eloquently with more followers to back them up? I, I cannot tell you. And it's maddening to try to follow it. Like I ended up becoming friends with Lane Norton because he ripped into me over a video about the minimum amount of protein. <laughs> he and I became friends because he ripped into me too. Okay. It's kind of funny how Hilarious, that works. Hilarious, yeah. right. But, but I'm, always willing, I'm always willing to open yeah. my mind. I'm always willing to learn. And there's no dogma in it for me. I don't have a Jillian Michaels diet. I don't do these studies. Yep. I'm not a PhD. So I was like, Lane, this is years ago at this point, three years ago, I go, you realize this isn't coming from me, right? This is the American Medical Association who made this recommendation. This is coming from a PhD that I work with who has her degree in nutritional sciences. 
this is I'm following the work of Dr. David Sinclair, Dr. David Sabatini. He, this is not coming from me, this position. And he's like, well, this is all bullshit. And the truth is he convinced me on a, on a couple of things. So, you know, the kidney stuff, the bone stuff with too much protein. I bought it 100%. I was like, okay, I see how this is all wrong. I see how the recommended daily allowance is more because arguably they weren't measuring how much amino acids we lost back in the day with the proper or accurate enough tech and that's changed. But the mTOR stuff, like yeah. you still haven't convinced me there. And I love him. I think he's brilliant. But I also love David Sinclair and David Sabatini and like all... all so that's, you're right. It's like, which PhD are you going to follow? Yeah. But this is where I'm going to go back to common sense. So here's what it breaks down as for me. Okay. If I've got all this protein. What's my body doing with it? Well, I can't really store it. Can't store protein. So, all right. It puts me in an anabolic mode. I don't always want to be in an anabolic mode. Sometimes I want my body breaking stuff down and in a period of repair. And okay, I do think that having too many amino acids floating around, especially when I'm not exercising all the time or I'm not lifting weights heavily. Common sense to me says no more than 30% a day. That's just based on everything I know from all these other doctors over 20 years. My thought is I just don't need more than this. Did we evolve with tons and tons and tons of meat? I know in different parts of the world, maybe, I guess, like if you were a Native American in Alaska, you're eating a lot of protein and fat, not a lot of greens, I guess. But this is where I sort of, I can't follow all of the different positions mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And I have always had to bring it back to what, it, what seems obvious to me, yeah. right? Like who is eating a carnivore diet all the time and eating beef liver? Like, yeah, it's a kidding? small percentage of people. What the who, how were they doing this in 1900? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, pro provided they didn't die from getting a splinter and an infection from it, which in that case, you would take the antibiotics. You know, who? that's where it's, I kind of have to always dumb it down in order to move forward. And in doing so, it hasn't led me astray. Yeah, it's, the, common, the common sense of protein part can sometimes infuriate me too, because it's just, even as someone that eats a high protein diet, I... I look at this as how much is high protein for you though? That's also I would say for me it's probably fifty percent of my calories are protein. Okay, but so it's not look ridiculous. at your body though. Yeah, well that's how? that's where I'm exactly where I'm going with that's the common the sense. Difference. Thing. And if I'm if I'm training two hours exactly. a day, exactly, I'm going to eat more. Like that's again where the common sense comes in. Like why why is this? Why does it have to be so difficult sometimes? And I actually I do know why it's difficult sometimes because there's so much content, and so much information out there. Right. But it's like okay, like on one hand, if I'm not training a whole lot that day, I could see the argument that I should increase my protein intake to still have a stronger stimulus to not catabolize. That, that also makes sense. But the delta of the situation, right. like overall over the course of a week, if my training demand is lower that week, do I actually need more protein? I understand the argument saying like I would want to have higher protein maybe on like the one off day I'm not training to sort of protect that. That actually makes a lot of sense. But like if I'm not really having a training demand and let's talk about a lot of people that don't have a training demand, Most. I don't know if they need Tough. a ridiculous amount. That's and that's where yeah. like, I just, I, I think again, that it has its place. And again, I, I am a fan of moderate to high protein, but I also feel like I swim in a world of people that are creating a demand. You so do, the for more, sure. The more demand that you have, the more protein you need. And that's just the common sense piece of it. To a point, then there's a threshold, I'm sure, where if you're inactive, I'm sure there is a very fine line that nobody knows the exact, not where I the know. line is. If you're not training, then where is the line of how much protein you should have before you start catabolizing or start preserving? But without the adequate stimulus of training, you're not going to really build muscle. So your goal is just not breaking down at that point. Right. Yeah. And But I have found, <clears throat> so even on the intermittent fasting piece, which I'm not letting go of, by the way, like I don't give a who's <laughs> changed their mind. I'm not letting go of it. Yep. It makes perfect sense. Yep, that's we shouldn't be yep. eating all day long. I'm not going to let go of it. I, I understand. And I've always said this because I always understood calories in, calories out. Because that's what I'm good at is helping people lose weight. That's what I have done for decades I'm great at that job. I understand it. So when they use intermittent fasting as a means for weight loss, all you're doing is 
cutting 500 calories out of breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason it would work as a mechanism for weight loss. And if you're eating more in your feeding window, that's the reason it's not working for weight loss. So <clears throat> that part of, I don't use intermittent fat, fasting for weight loss. I don't want to lose weight. I also understand the autophagy conversation of, oh, it's arguable if you're in autophagy at 16 hours. Probably not. Even so, it's insignificant. Mm -hmm. You're getting better autophagy from exercising. Fine. I'm, I, I'm willing to throw that one away. But certainly, if you look at the work of Dr. Sachin Panda, mm -hmm. I, the guy, come on. Yeah. It's like if you follow circadian rhythms, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be eating all day long. There's okay. definitely a period where the body needs to rest from digestion and focus on repair. That, you don't need to show me a study, even yeah. though I've seen them and I've read them. Someone will give you another one that says it's bullshit, but of course. I've seen them. I've had doctors explain them to me. I wrote a book about longevity in 2018 with a medical researcher interviewing a bunch of doctors who specialize in neuroscience, right? The bottom line is, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It just the common sense of I don't think you should be eating all day long. Yeah. Look, a nice little window where the body can focus on other stuff, where you don't have insulin being released consistently from grazing or from waking up and eating first thing. And then it's, well, you're not going to get enough protein. You're going to mm -hmm. become catabolic. I haven't seen it. Yeah. I've yet to see it. Yeah, same here. I got my yeah. own DEXA scans. It doesn't happen for me. I'm not doing a crazy amount of high protein. And to be honest with you, I don't even do a, a crazy amount of resistance training because I am the anomaly. Like I, read, I interviewed Peter Atia and he goes, don't you just love those people who have accidental muscle gain? As in, <laughs> you know, the ones that are afraid to lift because they get big. Yeah. And he's like, ha. and I was like, I know, ridiculous. That's totally me. <laughs> like if I... If I do one set of bicep curls, I will look like a man tomorrow. I it's just is it's my unique genetics. I yeah. don't have a hard time. I'm the anomaly. I understand I'm the anomaly. However, even with, I've got one for you. Going back to Biggest Loser, here's one I think you'll find interesting. I was convinced that obviously if we're reducing their calories significantly and we were significantly had the girls on 800 calories a day and unlimited greens so i was like you can get enough carbohydrates protein and fat in this 800 calories and you can get all your micronutrients in your greens the boys i had double at 1600 and unlimited greens but i was like well they're you know they have calves this big they already have a ton of muscle i don't need more muscle they did not lose muscle and I remember thinking, because I did not like the doctor on the show, we didn't get along <laughs> at all. Especially because I worked with a bunch of other doctors who subspecialized, and this guy felt he was jack of all trades. He was playing psychiatrist. Harvard, Harvard Medical School, by the way. Not a quack. Yeah. But we didn't get along, and other doctors were giving me differing information. Anyway, nonetheless, he would dunk them and DEXA scan them. They didn't lose muscle. Hmm. I know. And I have no reason to tell you. I thought it was bull. I couldn't believe it. it. Made no sense to me. Still doesn't make sense to me. They did not lose muscle because we were doing a ton of resistance training. I was going to say just the activity. Tons. Yeah. But this is what I mean when I tell you, PhD, MD, the the education that I got working on that show in real time. They didn't. You tell me. Yeah. It's, it's How? I, I, that's the only thing I can tell you is of that 800 calories, half of it was protein because I was like, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want any, I want to maintain all the muscle I can, but I also have muscle to spare here. Nobody needs a calf this big yeah, yeah. as a girl. I think so, the body's going to find what's, what's, yeah, I'm what's like, reasonable. We don't need this much muscle. You've been carrying around 400 pounds. I, I'm, I'm willing to lose a bit. So anyway, the long and the short of it is it didn't happen. It doesn't happen to me. And you know, back in the day when I was personal training, I didn't have access to that stuff. You know, my little gym 25 years ago, it wasn't like I could throw a client in a DEXA scan, but I could take a 60 year old woman, reduce her calories and get an adequate amount of protein. And there wasn't like she was muscle wasting, yeah. her metabolism improved. That's like anecdotally, I don't see it. And I know Trust me, I've heard it all the, what is it, the Mendelian this and the human randomized control trial and the data study, data study, but 
there's always conflicting dogma. For sure. And it, that's why they kind of come back to... I've got another common sense one for you with the fasting too, is like people will think fasting is just going to waste a bunch of muscle away. And, and it, okay, like I'll give you that if, it, if you're... Long doing, periods, I'm with you 100%. And yes. when, I, when I had Peter Atia on the channel and we talked about how he's like no longer really... Because he was a big faster oh before. Oh my God, he was doing seven yeah. days though. And then like, and he talks about... He says, I'm not <laughs> fasting as much anymore, you know. Obviously, I used a big clickbait headline with it, but it was just like you actually get into the weeds yeah. of it and don't watch the, just the first 60 seconds. He's talking about his, these prolonged fasts. But the point is, is that with the exception of that, a common sense thing, if you don't use it, you will lose it. And when coming back to the, you know, the, the, the men that weren't losing muscle, like with fasting, people thought I was crazy because I would say, no, when you're fasting, it's probably one of the more important times for you to actually be working out. Maybe you're not doing hit, but you're... But your resistance training, well, why? Well, think about it. From a metabolic standpoint, like from a survival standpoint, don't you think the body's going to want to preserve what it deems necessary at that point in time? So you're not eating. And the body says, okay, Thomas is starving, but he's using his muscle. So I'm not going to pull away from that. I'm going to pull from somewhere else because clearly he needs this to survive right now because he's using his body. So let's protect the muscle. It's one of those things like, show me the literature. Sure, we can get into a little mechanistic bullshit. But at the end of the day, that's freaking common sense. But the, that's exactly kind of my point. Like, I, I was talking to Lane again recently, and he was saying to me that I think it's like seven out of eight amino acids that your body uses to rebuild lean mass is recycled. So I, I'm like, well, hold. Okay, pulling, from, pulling from a tendon for your bicep. But it's like, <laughs> if you're recycling it, okay, seven out of eight? I'm almost positive that's what he said. I, just interviewed him about that like I don't know a month ago. So if I'm wrong, Lane, don't freak out. I'm sorry. Anyway, the if I'm thinking like okay, it, if I'm recycling this much tissue and I have all this glycogen stored, and I'm skipping breakfast, like am I really losing? The, oh, you become catabolic. Like what over ten years? I mean, it just yeah. it doesn't make doesn't make sense to me because. All of those aminos that you're you're wasting, I'm now being told it's seven out of eight, and we're going to reuse anyway. Yeah. So how? how yeah. Atias talked about that too. Ca yeah. How <laughs> catabolic can you be? It starts to not make sense to me. Yeah. So when it stops making sense to me, and then I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it in my body. I'm not seeing it in the people I work with. Then I really kind of just don't buy in on it. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's so many ways to skin a cat. Yeah. Is there really a right or wrong way? Like if you're eating whole food and you're working out and you're getting your sleep and you're managing your stress. I love the science and I think it's super cool. And I will go down those rabbit holes. Does it really fucking matter? Honestly, does it matter if I'm having 50% protein instead of 30% of my daily calories from protein? Do you think if we did that study and checked me 40 years from now, there'd be a huge difference. I don't know. I mean, I would I would probably go safely say on record that I think that exercise is going to be the more important factor there. Right. Like I really feel like, and I'm not saying you can out-exercise a bad diet. Like I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you can out-exercise a bunch of processed right. garbage. But I am saying that like if we really looked at like, what's the 80-20 here? Like I do think, and, and then of course, I mean, we can have these trickle down discussions where like, if you eat like crap and you feel like crap, you're not going to move. Right. If you're eating like, if you're eating too little and you're going to have less non-exercise activity thermogenesis and you're going to burn, okay, we can have those discussions all day long, but that's where we start getting into the weeds again. So I don't want to back up and just say, hey, people should just get active because I understand that's I agree hard, with you. But totally. We got we to like, you know, there's got to be a spark and a catalyst somewhere. But it's the, it's the biohacking bull of trying to make it perfect mm -hmm. like okay i was talking to this kid um he's probably not a kid it, it, he's got also a phd in nutritional science his name's dr Do joey dr Munoz. kid dr kid <laughs> yeah but he's, he's brilliant and i realized with the damn glucose monitor i would have a meltdown anytime that thing would spike yeah. i'd have one spicy tuna roll and it would spike and i'd be pissed off all day long yeah and he goes Jill, th this doesn't matter in healthy people. Like one glucose spike is normal. It's healthy. You don't have type two diabetes. Like this makes no sense what you're doing. And I thought, what, how have I lost my common sense of I've lived my entire life eating this sushi roll and I, my biomarkers look amazing. 
outside of the 200 cholesterol, which supposedly doesn't matter because my calcium score is zero. Like, what? But all of a sudden, I'm buying into this this kind of insanity surrounding stabilizing glucose levels, which, listen, I obviously appreciate that, especially for people who have been eating badly for a long time and who have become hyperinsulinemic, you know, pre-diabetic, diabetic. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I get that. But for someone like you and I, I never would have thought twice about it until all of a sudden I'm down this rabbit hole on glucose monitoring and I usually don't fall for it. I usually am like, ah, Thomas, well, it's, it's, that. you look great. You're doing okay. Eat your sushi roll. It's interesting though. So it's easy for to get like into that, right? And I think that with a CGM where I feel like I have kind of rules with myself around them where I won't wear them for extended periods of time. I wear them because things change and right. I, I want to know in a period of hyper stress, how do I respond? Yeah, and it's not because I want to say, oh, that, you know, corn tortilla that I ate is terrible. It's because I'm genuinely kind of curious, like, okay, if I'm in a period of high stress, right. it's amazing how much I differently I respond to something. Or more importantly, independent of food, what just happens to my blood glucose when I sleep like crap? So all it does is validate, again, the common sense, right? right. Things like common sense, okay, hey, who would have ever thunk that being stressed out is probably bad for your health. <laughs> Who would have ever thunk that maybe not sleeping is bad for your health, right? But sometimes the biohacking community and even people like myself, I go through I'm phases. I'm so guilty of it. Trust we, we, me. We need, we, something we need that, like, that piece to look at to right. validate it. Because we, I think, as hopelessly maybe curious people, like – I always want to also doubt myself sometimes on things because I, I've learned, okay, I've been wrong so many times that I'm willing to bet that I could be wrong on some things. So sometimes giving myself some data helps me feel a little bit more confident and validated. I got another one for you. Metformin. Ah. Okay. okay. I wrote about this in 2017 for a book that came out in 2018. Again, not Jillian Michaels. I Every book I write, I write with doctors and we, or we're interviewing doctors. So like the pregnancy book had five different doctors, pediatrician, OBGYN, endocrinologist, a specialist in pregnancy fitness, a PhD in, in uh, nutritional sciences. Like I don't, this isn't Jillian Michael's opinion. I go to credible PhDs and MDs and ask them, right? Like what, what's the data on XYZ PDQ? So metformin, of course, you've got, uh, Dr. Jennifer Ashton talking about it on Good Morning America, and David Sinclair is talking about it. Everybody's talking about taking metformin, and for some reason, and trust me, I, I would, if it, if I thought it was going to work, I'd be the first one. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You're going to give a perfectly healthy person a diabetes drug. Like, I can't do it. There was, I could not bring myself to do it. And now it's like, well, we're not so sure that we should be stressing out the mitochondria this way. And well, now there's conflicting information about it. Yeah. So again, should you be taking metformin to live forever as a healthy person on a diabetes drug or not? But the common sense to me is this makes no sense. Yeah. Well, it's, you're messing with a pretty big system too. That's the thing that's like, I, you know, you're increasing AMPK phosphorylation, which is essentially just like you're like manually putting yourself into like a deficit without being in a deficit. So you're like not actually in a deficit, but your mitochondria is kind of in it. Like what, I'm like, show me the mechanism, like where this like make it make sense, please. Because it's not like I get it at a very superficial level. Like I understand. But the paper will say it makes yeah. sense. But, but it, the common sense to me doesn't make sense. And you know, and Peter Atia changed his mind on that too. Like, but Peter that, is all the way out there. Listen, yeah. he's a genius. It's, it's, it's he's a genius. However, you you know they'll say that people who are either the most poor or the most rich get the worst medical care because they have the ability to yeah. you either they're getting no medical care or you're shooting exosomes into your eyeballs and because <laughs> you have the money to do it right. Peter, it's not about the money, but it's about the access and it's about the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So Peter's like, yeah, now I'm taking rapamycin and uh, I've got these ulcers in my mouth. And I'm just like, is he kidding? Like, he'll do it. He will not eat for seven days. He He's like, yeah, you know, and then I I went rucking for 27 miles. I, he, he will go all the way out yeah. there. That's his personality. 
the common sense in me is like that seems crazy <laughs> no like it and he's like you know, i changed my mind about not eating for seven days i'm like well peter <laughs> do you need a paper to say you know like i i understand the benefits of these deep fasts i do and if i had cancer i would I probably would be the first one to do, even though they're like, well, that's not true. Cause you know, if you have cancer, you need muscle to survive cause it's muscle wasting. But I would definitely do a deep dive on whether or not a deep fast could have a real impact on helping your body get rid of cancerous cells. I don't know. I haven't looked into it, but I certainly would in that particular instance, but I mean, not eating for seven days, like for often, Yeah, often yeah, he was doing, I'm like, what was it? Once a month, or I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, he, he said it on my channel. I, was like, yeah, I think he would yeah, do but, three days every month. Okay, that's what it was. Yeah, and seven days a few times a year. Now, I would do thirty six hours once a month for sure. And I recently, when I uh, recently had a surgery on the that lymphangioma in my face, and I was like, okay, I want to heal from this quick. And I read a bunch of research. That's a lie. I read a couple of studies. I don't know why I said that to you. I read a couple of studies. <laughs> Um, about how fasting for 24 hour periods actually accelerated healing. It's like, well, it helps the body make more stem cells. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, well, there's also the repair process, right? That, yep. But it makes sense to me, yeah. even though you're thinking, well, you need all this protein to heal. But then I would feed, I'd give myself protein, like 24 hours, 36 hours, once a month max, once every two months. And if you're then working out and you're eating your protein, surely you'll be able to maintain yeah. it. But seven days, three days every month, like I don't need no. to be an MD to be like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't, that doesn't seem good. Yeah, that, that, that is a <laughs> lot. And I think it's, I see those with a lot of people in this space where they, they're they so smart that it it's counterproductive. Like it's, it's, it's I see it with, you see it with a lot of, a lot of just PhDs in general. Like they're so smart. You never know like the uh, kind of the age old thing of like, oh yeah, well he's got two AP, two PhDs, but he can't talk to a girl. You know, like right. it's like, it's, it's just yeah. like you miss the forest for the trees. And a lot, and now fortunately there's also a lot of like younger generation PhDs that are coming up that have pretty level heads on their shoulders. Maybe they're just like able to look at the world a little bit more globally. Right. But I'd say a lot of them, and people don't realize that a lot of times there, and I know Peter's not a, you know, PhD is obviously a different category. And this isn't to pick on Peter per se. This no, is to no, say. No. He's a genius. Yeah, this is to but say. But he will go all the way out there and with it. He'll be like, rap my son, let me see. And I'm like, oh. Well, it's, I mean, right back to the original discussion of people don't realize that when someone gets their PhD, it's in one tiny little right. isolated thing. And yeah. it's no discredit to how smart they are. Like Lane Norton is a very smart person. Rhonda he Patrick is. is a very smart person. Brilliant. And it's. But it's difficult to say, like, hey, like, are you looking at this globally? Are you a what the world needs in some ways is a generalist. I mean, if you go to the doctor and you have a problem with your like an orthopedic problem and you go to your general practitioner, like that's going to be a problem. But yes. if you say, like, I don't feel well, you typically start with a generalist, right? And I know we're getting into the weeds with like the medical system because that's obviously very broken. And if you have a special problem, then you could probably, it would be nice to just have access to that specialist. 100%. My pinky toe hurts. I wish I could just go straight to the orthopedist and actually like talk about my pinky right. toe and not have to go get a CT scan on my left wrist to see if my pinky toe hurts. You know, that's a whole different system. But I mean, when we look at the age of online content, it's so difficult because like we, I don't know if it's safe for us to be getting a wide breadth of knowledge from someone that has experience here, right? Yeah. And no one has enough time to consume all the content to diversify like what's actually supposed, they're inbound, right? Like, so then I'll give you, oh, go, go, sorry, no, I don't no, mean to no, interrupt no. So you, then, go, go, So go. then you're, you're, you're relying on other people to distill research, like even myself, right? Like people rely on me to distill research. And I'm like, well, then I start forming an unconscious bias that's unconscious to me. So is it really a bias? Because it's unconscious enough. I changed my unconscious bias and it was unconscious to it in the first place. So is it really a bias though? Not anymore. I mean, I, I guess I have my biases on what works for me, but I'm well versed enough to know that it may not work for you. And I also yeah, know I agree with you. that I'm, I'm going to be blunt here, that I'm a little mentally 
fucked up in the sense that like <laughs> I like to do extreme things I get and it. I used to kind of expect that from other people basically right. like well do like okay no I'm going to be the weirdo that does this but I'm also going to not try to be I used to try to be relatable with that and people would be like uh that's not fucking relatable bro like you're weird I'm like you know yeah I am weird okay fine yeah, but then you're aspirational and that's great. Yes, that works. Yeah, we talked about this yeah. over audio message back and yeah, forth. Yeah, exactly. You're aspirational. And I think that's really important. Not everybody's relatable. Most people aren't relatable. I think it kind of sucks when everybody tries to be relatable. It's like that episode of SpongeBob, the normal one. Did you ever see that? No. no people that are watching would know. Like, it's like, <laughs> like where he just tries to be normal and he just becomes like this, like a little blob that's like on a computer. Oh, and he's just like, hi, I'm terrible. normal. Yeah. 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 Like, you, you want great athletes to inspire you, great musicians to inspire you. You shouldn't, I don't know, relatable's boring. Yeah. Like you want to be aspirational. Give somebody something to aspire towards. But I just, I don't, I'll give you another one. Here's another one. Anti-nutrients. Uh, Get the f yeah. out of here. Get out, come on. Like, oh God, Paul Saladino and broccoli. I, <laughs> people... Now he is softening his stance on some of this. Oh stuff. my god! Because Lane has been tearing him <laughs> to elbow. Am I allowed to swear on your channel? I'm sorry. Forever. I mean, and I even send him stuff, and he's like, "Leave it with me." I'm like, "Will you do this for me, please?" Because I, he can speak the science and get into the oh, and the exothen it's such, such and such, and the clinical human randomized control Mendelian. All the science speak. Here's Jillian Michaels going. People have been eating broccoli for a long time. And it seems, as a generalist, the data reflects it allows people to maintain a leaner, leaner body mass, and they seem to be healthier when they eat broccoli. And then you give it to someone like Lane, who will just, you know, take the science and tear the guy asunder. But then I'll talk to a Dr. William Lee, or I'll, I'll you know, listen to Rhonda Patrick talk about anti-nutrients, and it's like, well, you know, if you isolate this one thing in the plant, and you eat, you know, us, the, the table's worth of broccoli, raw, maybe it could be thyrotoxic, but no one's doing that. They're cooking the food. They're, all the other stuff in the broccoli is great for you. Like lectins. No one's eating kidney beans raw. You'd have yep. no teeth. Like, come on. We've been eating that. You know, and then a gastroenterologist will come out and talk about how if you eat Dr. Robin Shotcan. If you eat one cup of kidney beans for a month, you can improve your microbiome by blah, blah, blah. I can't even remember the study. Nevertheless, point being, I don't need conflicting studies about beans. I know people have been eating beans for a long time, and they they seem good. The, the Mediterranean diet. Well, also, the interesting thing about beans is the uh, what the Nicoyans down at the uh, the peninsula of Costa Rica. That is this a has, blue zone thing? It's is it a blue? Sort of, but it's <laughs> okay. like, so it's a weird thing because the Nicoyan, that peninsula is like really the, really the part of Costa Rica that has like the interesting, um, really long lifespan and also extremely high quality of life. Like they're very active until they're older. And one thing that's like different from the rest of the blue zones is they do eat about 30% protein. So they eat a little bit more than the other blue zones, but a lot of that protein plus a lot of the fiber they're getting from is from black beans, a crap load of black beans. And it was kind of interesting because... Uh, you talk to some people and they'll highlight one portion of that, talking right. about the meat, which like, okay, yeah. Like it, it is different from a lot of the other blue zones, but in the sense of that, especially different from like, say, Loma Linda or whatever. But yeah, they have a little more protein, but they're also like their fiber intake is quite different. And it's, I think there is some bit of it. I've been a very pro lentil guy for a long time. And I have pissed off a lot of people by liking lentils, which is interesting. That How you can is that even possible? There's so much data yeah. out there to suggest that, like the resistant starch, all the fiber, all the benefits to your microbiome. I will eat a big, giant New York steak with my bowl of lentils and piss both groups off. By the way, <laughs> how are your... You seem healthy. Any problems? No. Okay. I mean, that's, come on. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is I'm like we should be furious at Kellogg's yeah. for marketing poison to our children, and instead we're afraid of beans. This is what yeah. I'm talking about. I I don't need. I I will interview Dr. Robin Chuckin and interview Dr. William Lee to teach the person that's afraid of beans not to be afraid of beans. But oh God, no, it's wouldn't uh, common sense tell you. The common sense tells me that the enemy is out there right. and that we're all here, right? And yeah. I've said this so many times. It's like, guys, like, I don't, I, first of all, like, vegan, carnivore, whatever, at the end of the day, like, 
hey, good on you for like being focused on bettering how you feel. Agreed. We're all in the same camp yes, here. Yes, I agree. Okay? I don't care if you eat nothing but a bowl of kale or the fact that, you know, nothing hey. Nothing but a bowl of kale. <laughs> but, and I don't care. I mean, if you choose to eat nothing but a, you know, a bowl of pulled pork, that's cool too. Like, but keep in mind that like the overall magnum opus that we're all working on here is feeling better. And like, yeah. so like, why can't we all realize that we're all in the same house and the enemy is actually out there all along? Like, but instead we're fighting. It's like I know because it's, it's the dogma. A, yeah, it's, there's a it, war going on outside, but you'd, you'd rather fight with your wife it, or fight with your like a hundred percent. You know, the only reason that I didn't like keto is because I felt that it was a real struggle for people, and I felt they thought they had to do it to lose weight. And I was like, you don't need to do this to lose weight. I've taken a ton of weight off of people without being on keto anecdotally it it doesn't it doesn't play out for me not not with any of the contestants i worked with like you they don't do better on keto mm -hmm. the biomarkers aren't different like it's kind of six and one yep. and they found it harder with that said if someone loves it then okay fine i just to me i would say like just make sure you're getting enough fiber make sure you get enough plants in there i'm not so sure about all this saturated fat now there's new research to suggest that's the devil. Yeah. So, you know, so again, again, common sense, don't overeat, try to eat clean meat, try to get more plants in there. Okay. But if, if you're coming out saying, oh, it's the only way to lose weight, that's the part where I'm like, eh. If you love it, I, I think of it as a religion. I respect all religions. There are certain rules that apply to all of us. We really shouldn't be eating fake food, fake colors, fake flavors, fake sugars. That applies to all of us. That is not food should just kind of universally be a no or very minimal. Mm -hmm. The 80-20, right? Yeah. It's going to get in there. Let's try to make more good choices than bad. Calories in, calories out. That matters. It applies to all of us, even though we have different metabolisms. The math is still the math. You still have to, if you burn 3,000 calories a day and you eat 4,000 calories a day, you will start to get bigger. Yep. I can only eat 1,500 calories a day, but if I eat 2,000 calories a day, I'll start to get bigger. The, 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 the biochemistry applies to both of us. And move your body, sleep. The rest of it, you're right. It's like, it's crazy how we fight with each other. At the end of the day, like, if it's not food, it doesn't make sense to really eat it. Like I just, we are still, a living organism right. and it's not and we can bioengineer our way until we're blue in the face because yes our prefrontal cortex is probably advancing faster than the rest of our actual body and we're getting smarter and we're outthinking our own bodies and that's kind of dangerous plus technology increasing the speed of it right so right. it's like but maybe there will come a time in the next couple thousand tens of thousands hundred thousand years where our bodies will adapt to that but i, I think don't we're gonna make it that long <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but i, I have thought about that yeah. like do we learn to run off saccharin for fuel yeah. is there a microbe that develops in our gut that can use it maybe yeah. but do you really want to be the one that dies of cancer along the way in yeah. this evolutionary chain and i get that it's like oh you're saying saccharin kills people i'm just saying i don't want to risk it and i do think it's toxic load it's I think dose dependent, like it's a dose dependent relationship on all this stuff. Agreed. Yeah. And it's, it's the fact that it's, it's in your hairspray. It's on my face, on my skin. Then it's going to be off gassing from the, the laminate on the table and the chemicals in your underwear. So all of it together, I'm just trying to mitigate a toxic load. And that's why I try to avoid fake food often. You'll see people, oh, you... How, you know, you would take so much artificial sweetener to create problems. It's like, really? Are you sure? I mean, collectively speaking, do you, do you, why? Why why fight for that? I don't get it. I don't. I see a lot of people online fighting for artificial sweeteners. It's like, surely you've been paid. And then I, yeah. you, know, you find out that a bunch of registered dietitians, this is also yeah. where the stuff online gets scary, is they're paid yeah. by soda companies to put it some hashtag that aspartame isn't bad for you. Yeah. And they have a de 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 degree, <laughs> registered dietitians. That was, a, that was a scary time when that all came out. That was kind of like, I mean, and it's just, and no matter where your opinion lies on diet soda, it's scary either way. The fact that 
people that are supposed to be credible safe sources are able to be bought and it's it just it's it's very unfortunate but that's where i'd like i'm like you have to always come back to your common sense yeah. does it seem like food when you what's in there really does that did it have a mother does it come from a plant that's not food yeah. so common sense should be like if you really want to indulge in that do it sparingly yeah. i'm with you well jillian where can everyone find you um, they can find me at gosh, I don't know, jillianmichaels.com, I guess. Everything lives <laughs> through there. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Everywhere. Here with you. Everywhere. Perfect. Well, thanks for hopping on. <laughs> Thank you for having Bye. me. I appreciate it.